So when we think about a scale in terms of the, you know, how good or bad a scale is doing, how like, you know, it, it, it's sort of related to reliability because the more reliable a scale is, the less error there is. And this is sort of a, a, a measure of how much error there is in the scale. So um, we've talked about measurement error in terms of the error associated in trying to predict something or estimate a, you know, a true score from a specific test. Because uh, remember, we have uh, x equals true score plus error. You know, we can calculate the reliability of a measure. And because of that, we can also then compute the, the, uh, the actual standard error of measurement. And basically, all it's doing is taking the reliability and converting it over to a scale that uh, the measure is measured on. Right? This is the standard deviation of the scale you're talking about. 1 minus r this being reliability, this is going to be then one minus reliability, which gives you the error. So this is the amount of error in the, you know, in this standard deviation. And that gives you then the standard error of measurement. It tells you how much error there is in the measure. And it's measured on the scale that the items are measured on. Right? So it's putting it back into there. So using that same continuous, the same continuous items, we got that total variance was 254.41, that's what we, we got when we um, added up everything in this matrix, right? We added everything up and got a uh, total variance for it, 254.41. If I take the square root of that, it tells me that the, the standard deviation of the scale is 15.95. With me so far? Pretty straightforward. And we know that we figured out that the alpha was about 0.8964 uh, from last time. So we can then compute this. So what would be the standard error of the measure here? We're actually plugging stuff in. We got that the, the S here is the standard deviation. So that's at 15.95. And multiply that by the square root of 1 minus the 0.8964. And what do we get? So the one minus, um, I'm sorry, good. 0 0.1036 for the whole thing. I was going to do it. I was going to do part by part. Okay. Yeah. One minus 0.8964. All right. So just the one minus here is the 1036. All right. So this, so this part, so this is not the answer. This is the, this is just the, the subtracting the part inside, right? Yeah, that sounds more, more right. I was like, that's a really small number. So if, when we subtract those, when we subtract these two, we get that point 1036 in there. Let's still need a square root and we still need the 15.95 times that. So what's 15.94 times the square root of 1036? What did you say it was? Five point one three four. Okay. This is the the standard error of measurement. It's like how much variability, how much of the the. So if you think about it, like five point one three four is you know uh, that is a measure of how much error there is in terms of the the scale. How much prediction error there would be. Right. So uh, basically, if you're measuring something on this scale, think about it. It's like whatever you're measuring going to be sort of plus or minus the sort of five units. So it's almost sort of the variability of error there is on that scale. So one of the things that um, when we talk about measurement theory, we talk about factor analysis, and we talk about all these, these stuff we've talked about for at least two semesters, exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor models. We're really interested in how well do items go together. And how, you know, what are the loadings for each item on a scale? And we're using this more sort of you know, theoretical approach. Can we actually look at how much a factor is driving responses to items? And it's really sophisticated in this way that we do that with exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis. But you got to think about when you respond to questions, it matters that the question that you're responding to relates to the thing you're trying to measure. 
But when you look at just how much each item is related to the factor, it's like missing a piece. Um, we, we think about it as testing. Because typically when we think about testing, we almost always assume that the items are related to the factor or related to the construct. Like, so if you're taking a math test, and it's a math question, you're assuming that the math question is related to uh, whatever math you're taking, geometry, algebra, whatever it is. But what's more important in terms of how it's going to affect your score or your ability to answer a question is how difficult the question is, right? You know, if the question is really easy, then it's not a very good measure of how much you know that area. If the question is really difficult, then it's a much, uh, it's a much sort of harder uh, question, but it also, if you answer it, it tells you a lot more about how much that person knows about that particular construct. So in, in factor models, whether they're exploratory or confirmatory, we oftentimes ignore the difficulty, which is odd because that tends to be a big part of it. When you look at a, a test bank from tech, you know, textbooks give you like test banks and other stuff uh, oftentimes, they oftentimes will go through and, and rate for you just how difficult the items are. Uh, so you know to sort of sprinkle through, they don't have just nothing but easy questions or nothing but hard questions. So you can sort of mix them around. All right. So when you're doing those kinds of tests, even like if, if, if any of you have ever done like the, if you're like TA and ever like ran Scantrons and stuff, some of the, the more sophisticated Scantron machines, like the one we have in our department, it'll tell you all kinds of stuff about the items. It'll tell you uh, how many people answer that question correctly. It'll tell you how much that item relates to the total score and all kinds of these cool metrics that they use. And that's really all getting into this idea of sort of item analysis. It tells you about the, the questions, especially when, when you want to look at using the, the questions over again, but also it might actually affect the way that you score it. So if you have a question that's really difficult, maybe that question gets more points. If a question that's really easy, maybe it gets less points. Sort of weight it by the difficulty or something. So when we think about what are good items, we tend to think of uh, two different things. There's two different parts of what makes a good item. And up until this point, we've been, we've been ignoring one half of that. We've been only looking at what's called in the sort of testing um, jargon, something called discriminability. So when we talk about what are good items, there's really two pieces. Uh, how much does the item relate to the thing you're trying to measure? That's really getting at this idea of discriminability. That really, you know, it goes along with um, uh, things like loadings, right? So when you're doing a factor model, a loading tells you how much the item relates to the fact, and that's really sort of the item's discriminability. But the thing that we don't often think about, at least in terms of factor models and stuff we've been talking about so far, is uh, item difficulty. And it's called item difficulty, but I want to, I want to, you know, embed this in your brain that you need to think about it really as the item's easiness. And the reason why is because you would think if it's called difficulty, that the higher the score is, it means it's more difficult. It's actually not true. The higher the score is, the easier the item is. It's actually low scores that are difficult. So, you know, something, if you think about percentage of, uh, if I give a, a test to 100 students, right, and 20 of them answer a question correctly, that's not an easy question. That's a hard question, right? So it has a lower probability, a lower proportion. A question where 80 or 90% of students are getting it correct is an easy question easier question and uh you know it it has a higher proportion it's a higher score okay so item difficulty uh tends to be fairly easy to think about but it, it tends to be something that gets lost in the shuffle when we're thinking about um psychometrics in terms of factor analysis and stuff but um we we tend to focus a lot on discriminability in the in classical test theory we're not doing things like factors and looking at loadings we tend to, to look at it a little bit differently and a little more simply, but it actually has a pretty good, you know, oftentimes fairly analogous to what you'd find in a factor model too. So there's 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 more than these two um, approaches, but these are, are two that are often used um, uh, often to look at an item's discriminability. So you got the extreme group method and you got the item total correlation method. The extreme group method makes a lot of sense. If you um, if you want an item that is highly discriminating, it should be able to tell people who are high on, let's say, looking at math ability, people who are really high in math ability should get the question correct. People who are really low in math ability should not get the question correct. And that would mean the item is very discriminating, right? It can, you can tell those people apart. So you create extreme groups based on the total test score and then look to see what proportion of those students in the extreme groups get the answer correct. 
Right? You should, you, then that tells you how much the item is discriminating. The item total correlation method, this is really a, um, it's like a proxy for, for factor analysis. Because in factor analysis, we think, all right, we have this factor, and that factor is driving all the items. And the factor is just a fancy, sophisticated form of uh, composite, right? We're just, we're adding up the items, we're combining them together, but we're doing so by weighting the items differently, you know? Well, if I take and just substitute the total composite score in for the factor and look at how much each item correlates to the total, it'll give me an idea of how much each item relates to the, the thing you're trying to measure. So we just, we're allowing the total test score to stand in for what we would use the, a factor for in a factor analysis. And then one of the things we can do is look at something called an item characteristic curve to see these two things together and how they sort of work. So uh, item, item characteristic curves are something you see a lot more in IRT. They're very common there. You don't see them as much in uh, classical test theory, but you can make them. They're, they're called empirical uh, IIC, uh, item characteristic curves. We'll talk about sort of how to make those in a sec too. And they actually are, they're pretty good because they, they do a couple things. One is they test for um, some of the assumptions we have in uh, classical test theory, but they also can tell you a bit about discrimination and, and difficulty. All right, so item difficulty. The, the proportion of people who get a particular item correct or that endorse an item, right, if there is no correct response, uh, like an MMPI, right, there are yes, no questions. We're not talking about, it's not, the items aren't, aren't correct or incorrect, but they're either you're endorsing the item or you're not, saying yes or saying no. So if we look at the proportion of people who actually endorse the item and get the item correct, we can think about that as the item's difficulty. The higher that portion is, the easier the item is. The lower that portion is, the harder the item is, the more difficult the item is. So like I said, it's oftentimes thought of the item as easiness because it's based on the number correct endorsed. High numbers mean easier, low numbers mean more difficult. So they, they're, again, there are more than two ways, but the two ways that are often used are uh, how well does each item discriminate between individuals who are scoring high and low on the test as a whole? So whatever the trait is of interest, right? If you're looking at some um, depression and you have a bunch of items on depression, you can look at, think about it, we do this all the time um, in psychology. We, we do these sort of extreme group things where we'll take a bunch of clinically diagnosed depressed patients and we'll take a bunch of low depressed, right? Um, or it, we do with lots of things, just reading through a thesis paper where they looked at a, a screener for ADHD and took the highest third of the students as the high group and the lowest third of the, uh, as the low group, ignoring the sort of middle you know, middle students, to compare those sort of high on this ADHD screener and low on the ADHD screener. We tend to do that. We tend to make these sort of extreme groups so that we can actually look at items that actually can tell those groups apart are then good items, right? They're, they're actually items uh, that are well discriminating and, and work well for depression or if it's math ability or whatever it is. So simply how well each, is each item related to the traits? Right, so the the more it's related to the trait, the more the the better it's going to be at sort of telling the telling those kinds of groups apart. Uh, one and two are really the same. The more an item relate is related to the trait, the better it can distinguish high and low scoring um, individuals. Okay. So again, this is the reason why I like people like classical test theories because you can do everything fairly simply. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of math. There's not a whole lot of black box sort of you know computer program stuff going on. It's just First, you're going to identify two extreme groups, and there's lots of ways of doing that. People oftentimes will just uh, cut the groups into thirds, take the top third and the bottom third and compare them. You're going to compute the difficulty for the top group and compute the difficulty for the bottom group. You're going to subtract those two difficulties and the, the items that have a, have a, a larger difference between those difficulties uh, are more discriminating. The items that are closer together are less discriminating. Let's look at this. This is like a little crazy. Let's talk about this for a second. So I took this. Uh, we're going to see this a few times because I have this as a, an example in the next uh, the next thing to the next uh, lecture. So what I did here is I took there's uh, I think 24 items. I think yeah, 24 items. And I looked at uh, I split the those into people who score high and people who score low. So what this is this is these are questions on the MMPI that have been identified to, to load on a construct of social anxiety. 
guy. So I prefer to pass people I know, uh, people I know on the street or something like that. I forgot what the whole thing is. I'm a very sociable person, which is obviously reversed. I like to go to parties and other affairs with lots of loud fun or some weird, quite weird wording like that. It makes me uncomfortable to put on a stunt at a party with other people watching. It's like, again, put on a stunt. I'm not sure what the hell that means, but whatever. I find it hard to make talk. I, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be, a, I find it hard to make small talk, but I find it hard to make talk when I meet new people. Uh, I wish I were not so shy. Right, so these are just questions about uh, so social, social anxiety. So I, I took the total test score and I split it up into, into three groups, basically just binned it, binned it in terms of, um, you know, making, uh, cutting out 33%, 66%. Anyway, so I, so I cut this up in there, 33%, 66%, and took the, the top, the, you know, the, 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 the highest group, people that scored the highest on here, right? And the, the group that actually was on the low end. So people in the top, you know, they, meaning that they, they have the highest overall score on the test, 56% of them for this first item endorse this item. Okay. It's something like, I prefer to pass by people I know when I see them on the street or something like that. Okay. So it's, uh, so if you have high social anxiety, uh, a little more than half of them actually uh, endorsed it, said, yes, that's true. Um, we're in the low group, the lowest scoring uh, third, only, you know, 6%. You subtract those two, the difference in difficulty is 0.501. That tells me how discriminating this item is. This is the difference between the highest and lowest scoring um, individuals, right, those groups. So which item is the most discriminating? Yeah, so I think I even underlined them. So there's, there's an underline here, 0.786. Trying to see if I can follow you. Yeah, so parties are more likely to sit by myself or with just a few other people or something like that is what I think what the rest of the, the question is. So if you answer yes to this, right, so people who are, who are higher in social anxiety, I mean, 86% of them endorse the item. Where if you're low, you know, only like 7%. That's a, that's a very big difference. The least discriminating item is this one where it says, um, I'm never happier than when alone. The reason why that one is uh, is low discriminating is because even if you're high on social anxiety, you're still you're only 24% likely to answer this question, right? Because because social anxiety doesn't mean, necessarily mean you like to be alone. You may actually like the presence of other people, just usually one or two other people, not large groups, not people you don't know. So this so this may be actually targeting a sort of slightly different thing, more like social isolation than social anxiety. And that's why it's not very discriminating because even people who are really high on it still don't uh, aren't likely to to respond to it. So in this way, we can see that you know it, it, there's lots of different ones. We got you know there's some very discriminating items, and there's some other ones that are actually pretty low. Like um, I often cross the street in order not to meet someone I see. So that's a, that's a you know a pretty high level of, of avoidance there, but. Uh, um, I think people with social anxiety are not likely to, I mean, they're like 31% versus 4%. So it's just still a fairly low discriminating item. So this, people do this, it does mean you're leaving out like a third of the people, right? That you're, um, that are in that sort of middle group. But this does give you a very a good idea of just how discriminating items are. But the more common method is to use uh, an item total correlation. So let the total test score stand in for the trade of interest. So it's a rough sort of estimate or proxy for uh, a factor. It's just a factor with all the error built into it, right? It's all, it's all connected, combined. Correlate each item with the total test score. Uh, items with higher item total correlations are more discriminating, right? Because if, I, if I'm high on this question, I'm also high on the total. If I'm low on the question, I'm also low on the total. So it, the, if an item correlates highly with the total, then it is a discriminating item. Uh, so these, these correlations are like rough factor loadings. They're not exactly factor loadings, but they're uh, sort of rough estimates of it. If you're if the items are continuous items, which is what we typically use, like with Likert scales or those kind of things, then you can just use Pearson correlations between each item and the total. And um, 
if they're dichotomous items, then we'll get to, we'll get to things that they use like a point by serial correlation instead of a Pearson one. Like if they're yes no questions or something like that. The one thing to not mention to you that I will mention in a second, there is something that we're going to talk about in the lab later. So the problem with the problem with this, like even in SPSS, is that with an item total correlation, this item is in the total. All right, so when I'm adding up all the items, the item that I'm interested in is also in the total, which is going to uh, potentially, you know, drive up the correlation a little bit simply because the item's variance is in the total. So there is a different approach that they will talk about later on. It's just something called the rest score, which is a, a funny term. Rest score, which literally means instead of an item total, it's the correlation between the item and the rest of the items, the total of the rest of the items, right? So if I'm doing, uh, I, let's say I have five items. If for I, I would take a correlation between, uh, say, item number one, and then I would correlate that with uh, item two plus item three plus item four plus item five, right? So that would be... This would be the rest score for item number one. Rest score. Make sense? Because I'm taking correlation between this one and the rest of the scores. For item number two, I'm going to correlate that with um, I1 plus I3 plus I4 plus I5. Right? So every item has a different rest score. What that does is it helps to eliminate some of the variability of the correlation that's due to just having the item in the total. Okay, so sometimes uh, in Levon they call this, they don't call it a rest score, they call it a, they have an item total correlation and then they have the drop item or they have a drop column, which is the, the correlation between the item and then the total dropping that item. So they call it a drop instead of a rest score. Same basic idea. All right, makes sense? This actually tends to be a little bit more accurate in terms of what's going on because it's how much the atom relates to everything else in the scale as opposed to itself and everything else. But you get the idea. So we'll talk about this because there's a there's a package in, um, in uh, R that you can actually compute rest scores and it'll actually do something called a, a rest score. It'll do a... Um, an item characteristic curve based on the rest scores, which is actually pretty cool too. So we'll talk about that when we get to lab. So here are the same items. And then here's just showing the, the item total correlations. They looked down the same one. What was it? Sit by, uh, uh, um, more likely to sit by, no, it wasn't that one. It was uh, I'm never happier than one alone. All right, so this is not even the largest correlation. Right, so there is some, it, there is, it doesn't, there is some disagreement between the extreme group and this one. The most extreme one here is probably like this one. The parties are more likely to say, oh, that, that was the most extreme one before. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was, this is the one that was the lowest before. This is the one that's the most extreme, and it actually looks like it is again. I don't see another one that's larger than that one. So it's capturing the fact that this item is likely the, um, the one that is the most discriminating, right? Where, what's the lowest? Is there anything lower than 3.326? I don't think so. No, there is, 306. So here, we're getting a, a slight change where this one now is the lowest based on this method, but followed closely by this one, right? This is also pretty low. So my worries seem to disappear when I get into a crowd of friends or something like that, or, uh, uh, so this is a reverse coded item, but it's actually fairly because even because even people who are low on social anxiety probably wouldn't endorse this. Like, look, I like going to a crowd, hanging out with people. Sure, I like being social. But my worries don't all go away, right? It's because I'm doing that. So you know that may be why it's not completely um, endorsed by you know people on the low end. But um, I see some other you know high ones. This one, like uh, I like parties and socials. Again, the social socials, like you might as well say, I like, you know, I like uh, barn dances and 
what are those uh, like something old like or oh, sock hops or something you might as well just throw some old old timey other timey phrases socials just sounds funny to me but um i'm a very social person another discriminating item all right so, the, so the, this is fairly easy to do but this is the item total this is straight out of spss it's the item total correlation it doesn't have a rest score or drop uh drop item score so these are just item total so these are all a little bit inflated but it's fine because it's still they're all inflated probably by about the same amount and so it's easy to look at at least relatively which items are more or less discriminating based on this and it's just a point by serial correlation because the items are um dichotomies the total is continuous just doing a point by serial correlation and figuring out those um how discriminating each item is <clears throat> okay so one thing we can do is look at these item characteristic curves as a way of sort of looking at how those things go together, how difficulty and discrimination can be viewed on a, on a graph. So a graph of the proportion of people getting each item correct compared to total test uh, scores on a test, which sounds a lot like the item total correlation, except um, and like the extreme group method, you know, we typically with the extreme group method we just look at the highest and lowest groups. Well, for this, we're actually going to cut the groups up into multiple groups, oftentimes something like nine or 10 or something groups. And we're going to look at as the total, if you, that's based on total score. As your total score group goes up, the amount of people endorsing the item should go up. You should have a higher proportion of people, right? Because if, if there's 10 items and I've answered nine of them, yes, I'm more likely to answer the 10th the one, yes, than if I only answered one item, yes, right. So, as the the as the groups sort of get higher and higher in their in their uh, level of the total test, the proportion of people endorsing any single item should get higher and higher. That's what basically what a, this uncharacteristic curve is sort of looking at. So, ideally, lower test scores should go along with lower proportions of people getting a particular item correct or endorsing an item, and ideally, higher test scores should go along with higher proportions of people getting a particular item correct. Matter of fact, not, not only ideally, this is something if, if the item is working, is functioning the way we want, the way it should be working, then this is sort of required. We actually need this to happen. That, that uh, if it's measuring ability, as my ability goes up, my chances of answering any one question should also go up. If not, then that's sort of weird. So this is, there's a term for it called monotonic. The so monotonic means that the item that as you go up, so so think about this for a second. Let's go back. Total test groups. So this is um, I took the twenty four items. So the highest someone can score on this is twenty four. So I said, all right, let's make one, two, three, four, five, six. I made six groups. So I got people in the highest group. These are people who scored twenty one out of twenty twenty one to twenty four on the twenty four item scale. Right. This is the sort of the high group. The next group is 17 to 20, and then 13 to 16, 9 to 12, 5 to 8, and down here is 0 to 4. So looking at any one item, let's just say item number 1, I would expect that if someone has a total test score out of 24 items, they scored somewhere between 0 and 4, the likelihood they're going to answer this question is going to be really low because they answered very few other questions. Their, their total test score is low between 0 and 4, so out of 24, possible questions they only said yes or got maximum of four correct what's the like likelihood they're going to answer this question yes well probably close to zero and the way this is actually computed is we look at everybody who answers zero to four and we actually compute all right what was the proportion of people in this group that answered this question well it was zero if they only answered zero to four other questions or total questions on the scale zero of them answered this question now in the five to eight group, about 10% of them answered this question. In the nine to 12 group, 25% of them answered this question. In the 30, 13 to 16 group, it went way up to 65%. And if they scored 17 to 20 on the total uh, on the total test score, then they're about 80%. And then if they're in the 21 to 24 range, they went up to 100% for this particular item. What makes it monotonic is as these groups, the total score groups are increasing, the proportions of, of people endorsing the item or getting the item correct is also increasing. That makes sense. Think about this as math, uh, as a math scale, like a math test. 
If there's 24 items on a math test, and I got between 21 and 24 of those items correct, and I pick any one item, what's the likelihood I'm going to get that item correct? Probably pretty high, because I got most of the other items correct. If I got zero of the other items correct, or even just one item correct, the chance of getting any one item correct is actually going to be pretty low. Makes sense. So this actually gives you an idea of of what the 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 proportions of correct or endorsement for each of these groups are gives us a, a rough idea of sort of what the curve would look like and if it's monotonic. Monotonic means that it's increasing across these groups. Like for example, a non-monotonic item looks like this. Now this is pretty weird. Like when you know think about this as um as a math test again. So when I look at this a particular item, it seems like it's not working very well. I have students that scored between 21 and perfect score on the test. But for some reason, only 50% 50, 50 of them got this one item correct. However, if I go down a little bit to, to students who are in the 17 to 20 uh, total score, 80% of them. So we actually starts off sort of monotonic and increasing across, gets to here, and then drops back down again. Uh, so this is a, a bad item. It's a non-monotonic monotonic item because increased ability actually decreases your likelihood of getting this item correct, which doesn't make any sense. So, so we want items to be monotonic. Okay, so if you're higher on the trait, if you're higher in math ability, I would expect that the proportion of those students who are higher on it should actually uh, answer more of the question. Like going back to this one, this makes sense. It's not so much. Sure. So sometimes what happens is you'll have students. So let's say there's a, a particular question that um, I've done this before, where where you ask a particular question that if your knowledge of the topic matter, say it's stats, is pretty good, um, you actually would do pretty well and answer it correctly. But if you know more about it, so that, so let's say you like I've seen this happen a lot. If you give if you give someone say you give a 320 exam, and in that 320 exam are a bunch of graduate students or PhD students in statistics. They may actually get a question correct, uh, incorrect, because they actually know enough about the item to know that it actually is incorrect. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, say because they they chose the right answer when the question's actually incorrect. But students up to that point, like the 17 to 20, these are these are decent undergrad students that are just answering along with their textbook that they were taught in that class but the the students at the very top are actually like no this is actually wrong right so they choose the wrong answer and it actually you know so they, so sometimes like i said before every semester it's like i know we taught you this last semester but that's not really true it's really like this and you sort of every semester you sort of do that you undo what you were taught before and it gets more complicated so when you know the more complicated explanation you sometimes will miss answers that, to simple questions because it's not really as cut and dry as the question might make it seem. Right? And then therefore it's a bad item, or at least it's not an item that's really good to use with a mixed um, sample like that. Right? It may be good just for the 320 students, but to include more advanced students in there, you'll get some problems like this. Let's say it's an item like a cry often or something like that for depression, right? Um, what you might see is that as, as depression increases, they're more likely to say that they do cry until you get to a certain point where people are um, so de so depressed, right, that they've sort of stopped caring and they don't cry much anymore. So they actually are now saying, nah, I really don't cry that much anymore. You know, just sort of whatever, don't care. Uh, or you actually get a thing too where if they get to a certain extreme level where they're contemplating suicide or have decided uh, uh, suicide ideation, that kind of stuff, that their mood and stuff actually will turn around. They'll actually feel better about it because they actually now have decided on how to, to address their problem. They're no longer as sad or cry as much anymore. So this actually would be a warning sign that all of a sudden they, uh, the, the emotional reaction to stuff has actually gone down. These people are actually probably in a, you know, in a critical group, you know, if they're answering that, uh, the, you know, that high. Make sense? So it actually changes, the, you know, so it does sort of go up that way until a certain point, and all of a sudden you're like, no, nah, I don't care anymore. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, you know, you get to that sort of nihilistic stage where you just don't care and stuff. So, again, I, that's not, like, clinically accurate. I'm just saying this is, like, a, you know, a potential example of how that might work.
Let's look at some of those Omega. This is an even worse item. All right, so as you're going up, it like starts to go up and it comes back down, and it goes back up again, and it comes back down. It it the it really tells me that the reason why it's a bad item is likely that whatever I'm measuring here. So let's say this is a math test, but I give you a geography question, right? And you're trying to look at how math relates to this geography question. It makes no sense, right? It's just that everyone's all over the place, right? Because it because really you know how much you know about this really has no bearing on what the item content is for this particular item. So it's just a bad item for that particular scale. So these are examples from, uh, this is like now turning those the same question. So you see the whole question there. I prefer to pass by people I know, but not have, but have not seen for a long time, unless they speak to me first. That's how long that question is. Okay. That's a lot of stuff. I would say that's a bad item. This is a whole, it, that's, it's an overly complex <laughs> item, but you can see it. So it's monotonic. Now, what this also tells me is how discriminating and or, um, difficult it is. So for difficulty, look at 50%. So if I go over to here, I need to be in this group. So if you think about the, the middle of these of this group, in the middle right here is sort of halfway between, right? Halfway between the groups. But to get to 50%, I actually have to, um, somewhere like here, and I got to drop it down, I actually have to be fairly, this is actually you know, where my ability needs to be to have at least a 50% chance of getting this question correct, right? So it's on the more difficult side. It's not difficult, but it's not on the easy side either. So it's a, it's a you know, moderately difficult question. The steeper the line is, the more discriminating it is because to tell the difference between groups, I have to, I actually have to go up quite a lot in my score be able to increase my probability by quite a lot. So it's not very discriminating. It's sort of almost like a flat line. I'm mean, not a flat line, but a, a linear sort of, inc you know, increasing line, a stable increasing line with the difficulty that's somewhere like here. Okay. So what does a, what other items look like? But here is a more discriminating item. You see why? Look like a question before it. You know, this is, again, it, it, it it moves very slowly between the groups, but here it starts off moving kind of slowly, but then it actually the speed in which it changes in the middle goes up really fast. It's much faster. There's, there's a fairly steep line right around the 50% mark. The line is actually fairly steep and it sort of levels back off again. That's sort of a normal way. You think of this like when we did logistic regression, right? The, the steeper the curve is near the 50% mark, the more, uh, you know, the, the larger the slopes are, right, in, in a logistic regression. Well, this is similar. This just means it's more discriminating. Where's the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is just slightly below the center. So this is a, you know, slightly, it's in the middle somewhere. Like it's on the easy side someplace because here's 50. You drop it down there. So this is a fairly easy item, but it's actually pretty, it's a pretty discriminating item, at least relative to this one. This is a more discriminating item. What about this thing? <laughs> What's going on here? If you look, 50% is here. Not very discriminating. It's just, it's, I mean, right, right here it is, right? It sort of goes up, whoop, and then it's like me, it sort of slowly increases, right? This item's so easy that even people at the very bottom are going to say, yeah, I guess so. This is a reverse coded item. So you got to think about that for a second too, but um, you know, the people are even likely to, to endorse the reverse of this item, even when they have the, almost no score. This is this item so easy that we don't even have a bottom of it. It starts off at, you know, 35%. Same thing here too. It makes me uncomfortable to put on a stunt at a party, even when others are doing the same sort of thing. That's the whole question. All right. Again, fairly easy. It, so you got to think about this again. This is a re, uh, this is this is a forward question. That even people who are low on social anxiety um, have a you know 33 percent chance of saying, yeah, it actually does make me uncomfortable. So I don't have to have social anxiety to say yes to this question. Right? The the difficulty is way 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 down down here. It's a pretty good item uh, in terms of. It's not like massively discriminating, but it does, you know, it, it, uh, it does t 
tell you apart, tell at least the extreme groups apart, right? The, here we're getting close to 100%. Here we're getting close to 0%. The difficulties uh, still on the sort of easy side of the middle. Right? And it's, it doesn't have a really steep slope. We think of an S-shaped curve, but I find it hard to make small talk when I meet new people, not make talk. I wish I were not so shy. Right, this one's actually curving the, the almost curving the wrong way. Right? You, you want the slope. You want to be like an S shape, and it's actually got almost this weird hump in the middle. It's still fairly easy. Right, not a very you know this item is not super discriminating. Difficulty is slightly higher than middle. Now you can see that most of these items are not super discriminating. And some of them are really, really easy. And that's why actually you're getting even the, the lowest group has a fairly high percentage of people responding to it. All right, not super discriminating. This one's, what's wrong with this one? Now, why is that? Because look at where 50% is. I have to be, I have to have answered like 20 of the other items on a social anxiety measure to have a 50% chance of saying yes to this one item. Like I dislike having people around me, right? So this is a, this is a difficult item. Makes sense because I have to be really high in social anxiety before even having a 50% chance of, of saying yes to this item. Because even people who answered every other item only have an 80% chance or 78% chance. And so we're getting nowhere near 100% because this item is very difficult. The whole line is shoved over, right? Uh, so where the 50% mark is here instead of being someplace in the middle like all the other items were. Another really, really hard, really difficult item. This one's even more difficult because in, in the sense of I got to be even higher to get to the same place and I'm nowhere near 100% when he, he, even if I answer all the other items. I like parties and socials. It's actually a pretty good item in terms of, you know, discriminating against the high and lows. It really is targeting about the middle of the scale. It's like dead center. Right, we're, you know, so if I'm somewhere between these two groups, I'm switching from uh, saying no to saying yes. Um, I have no dread of going into a room by myself where other people have already gathered and are talking. No dread. That's a weird wording. Look at this. It's just like a straight line. Right? Not very discriminating. Um, yeah, the difficulty is, you know, right around the same place. Whenever possible, I avoid being in a crowd. That's a little more discriminating than this one is. And, uh, but the difficulty is around the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're reverse coded. You have to think about them. So people who endorse it are actually low on social anxiety. People who say no are high. So you have to think about reversing those numbers when we're looking at the scale. Yeah, so, you, so they they have to be flipped before this makes any sense, or else the or else it would or else this, it would be going this way instead. Yeah. So they so they've been they've been flipped before, um, because the the total only makes sense if if adding up all the items makes sense towards the same total. So they have to be flipped to do this. Um, let's go back a second, because I know there's a lot of these. What was the most, based on the most discriminating, was at parties, I'm like, that was the one we were just on, it's the 316, okay. So look at this 316. This is, this is the most discriminating item because if you look at where it is by 50%, this has a, a sort of steep slope. It's a, it's a fairly easy item though. It's on the lower uh, side. So it's, it's, got, it's a fairly easy item, but it does discriminate pretty well between those on the high and low end. So it's got a fairly, so you can actually tell people apart right around here. If you're in the five to eight group and nine to 12 group, we can actually tell you apart because there's a big jump between them, right? Between, between the, the sort of, second and third groups, we can actually tell those people apart. I have to go a lot further, right? I can't tell people from 0, 04 to 58 as much. I can't tell, look up here, I mean, between 1720 and 2024, I can barely tell them apart. So the, 
The most discriminating place is right here, right around the 50 cent mark, and it's actually the most discriminating item at that point compared to all the other items in here. Right, this is an easy item, but again, this is reversed. Even people with low social anxiety are like, nope. <laughs> I don't like the go to dance. That's right. And uh, we even did this separately for men and women. It was even more ridiculous for men. Now, this is a combination of men and women. Um, when we looked at just men, it was, um, I love to go to dances was even, uh, cause again, I love to go to dances is reverse coded. So, um, people are, people are answering zero to this to indicate social anxiety, but for men, it was even easier. Uh, the, the, this whole thing was even higher because even low social anxiety men are like, Nope, <clears throat> I'm never happier than when alone. I think that was the most difficult one. You can see why. Even if I answered every other question, right? I answered 23 of the other questions and we're answering about this question, there's still only less than a 60% chance for me to say yeah. Okay. That's because of this group of 20 to 24 uh, scorers, only 58% of them responded yes to this item. So this is, you know, this it, it just barely passes the 50% mark way way up here it's a very difficult item not it's discriminating but not very difficult i'm sorry it's just yeah it's discriminating but not very difficult it's even people with um sorry other way around it's discriminating but very difficult because i have to have way more of of this to answer 50 percent i have to be much higher in social anxiety to answer even 50 percent uh, I enjoy social gatherings just to be with people. Again, not, not super discriminating, but it's okay. Um, looks like it's going around here. So one of these you'll notice, I enjoy the excitement of a crowd. That a lot of these questions are targeting, or you're getting that fifty percent right around the middle. So the, all these items seem to be targeting people of about medium um, social anxieties. People that are right around the middle of these groups which means they're all sort of bunched up. Now here's here's one that's a little bit more difficult, but a little bit higher, so that's sort of spreading it out, which is nice. My worst thing is fear, yeah. So this is a an odd item. Uh, it's difficulty is right here in sort of the middle, but we still got this weird thing where even at the very end, um, you know, people aren't really responding to it. So it's not very, not very discriminating. And it's got this weird thing that even at the low end, people are still saying 20%, you know, yes. But again, you got to think about it. Like, so it's, so ideally, and we'll talk more about this in the, in the IRT one too, is that what you'd want to see, so, you know, if this is your, this is whatever the trade is you're talking about here. If every single item so it seems to cut across the middle here, right? Let's use different colors, I guess. All of them seem to be going to the sort of same place in the scale. Like they're all targeting this sort of same place. The, the measure is really only good at looking at people in that range of the trait. Because right? you're only getting sort of medium difficulty items, which is what a lot of people do. They'll just say, all right, I'm not going to make questions that are too hard or too easy. I'll just make them all about medium difficulty. Well, that means you're only getting at people who are about in the middle of the tree. All right, so this is math ability. I'm not getting people who are really good at math or people who are really bad at math. I'm really targeting people that are sure right in the middle. And I really can't, it really doesn't give me any information about people who are at the, who are at the top or at the bottom. I can't tell them apart. If my goal is to try to figure out, you know, who's, who's the lowest to the highest score on a math scale, it's not really going to do that. I mean, basically just have two groups. Well, I know these people are all good. I know these people are not so good, but I can't really tell them apart. It doesn't discriminate against them in the middle. So what I, you typically want in a, in a scale, what you should try to target is you have some items that are difficult. Because these are targeting up here, right? They're, they're targeting more difficult. This is the same sort of trait. I also want some items that are easy. So it's targeting people down towards the bottom. And of course I want some that are sort of in the middle, right? That are down here. But I want them all to be fairly discriminating, meaning they relate to the thing I'm trying to, to measure. 
but they vary in their difficulty. So I can actually get an idea of how to separate people out. So I can figure out who's really more depressed, who's less depressed. Especially if I'm trying to figure out, look, I have some kind of cutoff, right? I have a cutoff here that, uh, that you know, anybody above this is clinically depressed. Anybody below this is not. I better be able to tell, tell these people apart really well, right? If all I can do is, I, I, if I can just tell these people and these people apart, well, shit, the people in here, I'm not going to know where to put them. Because, it, you know, it, I'm not very good at discriminating that in that fine-tuned way around the cutoff. I can only tell people who are definitely not depressed, people who are definitely depressed. But in the middle, I sort of like, I don't really know. It, it's sort of a uh, flip a coin. I'm not really sure where they're supposed to go because I can't tell them apart. Because the items don't really get at that. So we want to be able to, to vary the difficulty of the items while all the items tend to uh, be fairly discriminating. As well, sort of going through those items, you can see some of them, a lot of the items are targeting right in the middle of the scale, over and over again, middle, 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 middle. And those that are difficult tend to also be not very discriminating. Those that are easy tend to not also be, not be very discriminating. That's the, that's the issue, is trying to find a blend of items that are both discriminating and, um, uh, you know, vary in their difficulty on, on the scale. So you can actually sort of separate people out, be able to tell the difference across the treat range. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we tend to look at 50% because that's actually where the, the slope is reported. Because obviously the slope is changing all, all the way across the the range, but typically we compute like whatever the the the, discrimin, the the discriminability gets sort of calculated right there. But the reason why the, this this work the, the it's called discrimination discriminability is because if you have an item that is uh, that's not very discriminating again this so this is zero and this is like the probability of answering it correctly or something. Think about logistic regression, right? If if it's very Low discrimination, right? It sort of does that. I have to, and this is the trait, whatever this trait happens to be, I have to, I have to do, I have to gain a whole hell of a lot of trait to gain just barely any probability of answering this item correct. That's why it's not very discriminating because I can't really tell people apart very well. It doesn't really move. But if I have an item that is very discriminating, I can tell this person from that person, right? But I, but I can only tell this person from this person with this item, but I can't tell this person from this person because there's no difference there. I can't tell this from this person because there's no difference there either. So it only really helps me right here, which is why I need another item that helps me right here. You know what I mean? And another item that, uh, that sort of helps me right there. You know what I mean? So in, in order to tell people apart all the way across, I need items that are highly discriminating, or at least, you know, decently discriminating, but vary in difficulty so I can actually separate people out and see what people are actually like. And I can, I can actually tell people apart here. Now I can actually tell people real close to this cutoff, I know I can be fairly confident. Okay, you know, the, the, you know a person that's right here just above it, really belongs there and the person just below it really belongs there without having to worry about there being just too much variability and noise in there in terms of trying to diagnose someone with a with a clinical depression or something like that and having them institutionalized or something right you want it to be fairly um sensitive around that point if it isn't then it's not very good you're probably likely diagnosing people with stuff they don't have or vice versa 